Good afternoon, everybody. To the Chairperson of Council, Ms. Futi Mtoba, and other members of Council present here today, the Vice Chancellor and Principal of the University of Pretoria, Professor Francis Peterson, and other members of the Executive present here today, and various other members of the leadership of the University, including the Dean's Senate, Student Leadership, Institutional Forum, staff associations, and others. Distinguished graduates, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. I've had the privilege to serve two terms as Chancellor of University of the Free State, a role that required me to preside over graduation ceremonies. The current Vice Chancellor of this university, Professor Peterson, served as Vice Chancellor of the UFS for part of my tenure there as Chancellor. If he were here, I'm sure Professor Peterson would attest to the fact that I was a bit of an unusual Chancellor from the perspective of the number of graduation ceremonies that I physically presided over. Uh, my attendance of these many graduation ceremonies, and even though your chancellor is not here, I will not hint at the percentage of graduations that are physically attended, <clears throat> lest it ends up putting pressure on her to do the same. But the attendance of these many graduation ceremonies may have come across as indicative of my commitment and dedication to my role as Chancellor, but that would be a bit misleading. I attended all those graduations because I am a bit of a sentimentalist who loves graduation ceremonies. My love for graduation ceremonies goes back to the inspiration that I felt on the very first graduation day that I observed during my first year as a student at the University of Forte in 1974. Four years later, when it was my turn to graduate, I hoped to similarly inspire the first year students as I was inspired when I attended or observed my very first. But the most overwhelming feeling that I experienced on the day was appreciating the pride and joy that my working class parents displayed as they witnessed the fruits of their hard labor and seeing the very first university graduate that they had produced. Three other children of my parents subsequently obtained university degrees. I can still feel my mother's tears of joy and my father's beaming smile of pride. So that day was not about me, but about my parents and all those who had shaped and built me into the person that I had become. The light might have been shining on me on the day, but I reflected that light right back to where it belonged and where it should have been shined in the first place. And having said that, I want you as a graduate to look at those people up sitting on the podium because the light might be shining upon you today, but reflect this light back to the people who made you who turn out to be. So please give them a round of applause. A towering figure amongst those who built and shaped who I had become was none, none other than Stephen Bantubiko. The black consciousness ideology that he and his comrades at the time had infused into young black men and women like myself gave us amazing clarity as to our roles as agents of change and added steel into our characters 
and into our souls. I thus say to the graduates here today that much as you have earned the right to enjoy the light that has been shined upon you, please do radiate it back to all those who helped you build the one that you are today. One of the lessons that I learned during my tenure as UFS Chancellor is that none of you are here today to listen to speeches. I will thus make it brief to allow you to get on with what you're truly here to do. As I do that, let me take this opportunity to thank Professors Nolane van der Berg, Professor Bernard Slippers, Professor Mike Wingfield, and Dean Barand Erasmus for deeming me worthy of nomination for an honorary degree at UNESCO Pretoria. I also thank the Senate, the Council, for the honor of this general conferment of the degree. I'm truly and deeply humbled by the recognition which, I, as I stated earlier, goes way beyond me as a person. At this point, many of you might not appreciate what I'm going to say now, but I'm sure there's a few people sitting on the stage who will appreciate that. I feel compelled as I stand here to also recognize Dr. Ryan Arndt, who was the president of the FRD in 1992 and who decided to take a huge risk on me as a young man wet behind the ears and appointed me as vice president of the Foundation for Research Development, the predecessor to the current National Research Foundation. Ryan challenged me to play a key role in shaping a new society that was to emerge from the society that was deeply scarred by the many years of colonialism, racism, and apartheid. A brief message to the graduates today. You graduate into a world that is as exhilarating depending on where you are in the world as it is scary depending on where you are in the world. You are graduating into a world where watching the people of Gaza being, uh, being annihilated has become just one of the many news items in a regular news bulletin. The world where what is happening to the people of Gaza, the definition of genocide that has been applied previously to events like this one, all of a sudden, is being questioned whether it applies or not. You're graduating into a world where the oldest and wealthiest private university in the US, and that is Harvard University, was served with a letter that demanded, amongst other things, open quote, to shatter all diversity, equity, and inclusion programs, offices, committees, positions, and initiatives under whatever name and stop all DEI policies immediately. And another open quote, commission an external party which shall satisfy the federal government as to its competence and good faith to audit the student body, staff, faculty, and leadership for viewpoint diversity, close quote. Failure to comply with these demands is to result in the denial of federal funding to the tune of $2 billion US. Now, it is possible, ladies and gentlemen, that what we are witnessing here is a mere event-driven cyclical challenges that will cost correct in the next four years. But there's also a clear and present danger that we are witnessing structural challenges where societies are being reshaped for the long term. On the other hand, you are graduating into a world where the Internet of Things 
and generative AI offer staggeringly endless possibilities for the human race. Once the reality of generative AI became evident, the European leaders put AI at the top of their development agendas. And the European Commission was tasked to develop the European AI strategy. Similarly, the leadership in China took equally resolute decisions to place AI at the center of their development agenda. But for the part of the human race that finds itself on the African continent, this generative AI creates a certainty of a widening development gulf with the rest of the world, as African leaders still talk of AI as science fiction. Next year will mark 50 years since June 16, 1976, that momentous eruption when young people in this country decided that liberation will never come if they continue waiting for the elders to deliver that liberation. They took it upon themselves and sacrificed their lives. And that liberation, uh, it can be argued, even though others argue otherwise, has been delivered. Last year, we watched in utter amazement when young people of Botswana decided to take the future of their country into their own hands by ousting the political party that had governed or rather ruled that country for almost 60 years since independence in 1966. While many young people in Africa see emigration into the global north, and now including Dubai, as the solution to their personal development challenges, I wish to urge you all to recognize the power that you hold to shape this country and this continent into the country and continent that you wish them to be and to live in. I wish that you find the same kind of clarity of the power that you hold and the purpose that Stephen Bantubiko gave to me and my generation. In conclusion, we have heard that some of the policy decisions made in the U.S. led to upward of $2 billion being removed from the South African research and development landscape through executive orders issued by the President of the United States. Many South Africans are crying for the loss of that income, which we can all understand. But the question that we have to ask ourselves is why did we as a nation place ourselves in the position where we had to depend on the funds of other nations to help us solve our problems? Why could we not generate the same funding for ourselves? I look at this situation, and as I said earlier, as a unique opportunity for South Africa to convene itself into a conversation where government higher education in the private sector and civil society must come together and say, how do we become the self-dependent nation that will make us feel proud as a member of the community of nations? Let's use this crisis as a, a rallying point for us to reshape the future of this country. I thank you, ladies and gentlemen.